Hi, I'm Sasha Suda, Director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada. I want to acknowledge that the National Gallery of Canada is located on the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. We honour and thank the traditional keepers of this land. This summer, the Collector's Cosmos, the Meekins McLaren print collection will be on view at the National Gallery. This exhibition will bring together 233 works collected by Dr. Jonathan Meekins and Dr. Jacqueline McLaren over 40 years when they traveled, poured through exhibition catalogs, talked to dealers, traded, and planned to build one of the best Dutch and Flemish collections of prints from the 16th and 17th centuries in Canada. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Meekins and Dr. McLaren to discuss their collection and the upcoming exhibition. They're passionate about everything that they've done as collectors, but also as physicians. They have incredibly accomplished careers as physicians, leaders in both surgery and hospital administration, but also geriatric care and thinking about human-centered patient care. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jacqueline McLaren and Dr. Jonathan Meekins. Dr. Meekins, in the Collector's Cosmos catalog, you talk about being exposed to art at a very early age. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that early exposure to art and how it influenced your kind of, your stepping into a collector role. I think the experience of going to museums frequently as a child uh, would be before the age of 10, which mother would take my two sisters and I I don't remember actually how often, but it was something that was a regular part of our annual life, if you will. I do remember two very particular experiences. One is Goya's Disasters of War, which I think says a lot about Goya's Disasters of War that I would remember it over almost 80 years. And the other was going through drawers of uh, Japanese woodcuts. And I don't know how they allowed a, a young boy to do that, but at any rate, it happened. At least it's part of my, my memory of museums. The, the second really important thing that happened was being given a trip of eight weeks to Europe as a schoolboy at the age of 15, six in the UK, and two on the continent, where... Our exposure to culture in a wide variety of ways was not daily, but it was part of what the itinerary was about. And a very formative moment would be at the Rijksmuseum when we saw their Dutch paintings. Uh, for some reason, they resonated the landscapes and so on. And part of that has to do with uh, where I grew up in summertime, which was on a farm to some extent at a boys camp and our country place where we were involved constantly with manipulating the landscape. What's interesting is my most kind of visceral memories of visiting the two of you for the first time and the second time and the third time, it sort of happened to me each time, was stepping out onto the street after being in your apartment and being sort of transported to this magical place where the world was so much bigger and kind of timeless. And as you were just speaking, Jonathan, I really thought about, you know, a kid growing up in the country, being close to nature, really valuing that. And then also seeing that there's so much, you know, more than that, not better or worse, but more to sort of fill out the picture um, and being kind of recognizing the incredible kind of offerings of a city and a cultural life. Coming back to the landscape, in spring of 1981, you went to the Grand Palais. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what that meant um, to you. We went to all the exhibits during those years. Uh, that year we lived in, in Paris. And we left the big rooms where the paintings were. And if you don't like uh, Pizarro's paintings, that's your problem. We would have enjoyed that enormously, but to enter into this room where they were almost all etchings, there were very few in color, 
and they were small. The room was uh, long and narrow, and, and all of the prints were in frames the same size, 16 by 20. So there was a certain symmetry to what you were doing, and so you could move from one image to the next image. And they were delicious, really. There are people haying, collecting wood, doing a garden, uh, extremely rural. The marketplaces are, are quite special that uh, Pizarro did. We had spent that whole year looking for what would we collect? What was the next step in our life now that our academic careers were on a reasonable, steady plane? We've had a sabbatical. We're settling into ourselves intellectually, some more intellectual capital, stuff like that. And I, I guess we were looking for another outlet of some sort, another creative side to life. We um, are very pleased to have spent our lives in the university uh, and had tremendous rewards as a function of that, but one of the rewards is not a huge income. <laughs> uh, we live very comfortably, uh, let's not be confused about that, but the idea of buying paintings or sculptures or the furniture we saw on the left bank that was in the fifth, it wasn't possible. We, in other words, our, ta our taste for what was in wood, furniture, antiquities, uh, painting, sculpture, we, we, we could buy one, and that never made any sense to me. The furniture collecting, for example. Once you have the six key pieces, that's it. And it's not a collection, and you're not going to be turning them over. Um, you're not selling them, you're not paring down your collection or enhancing it in any way. And the same with painting. When you see very large paintings, you go, oh, that's wonderful. Now you have the idea of collecting. How many pieces are you going to collect and are you going to turn them over? And there are people who do that and they are successful at it. But the great thing about prints is they're little. You can take them off the wall. You can look at them. You can take them out of their frame and, and look through them and see the artist's fingers uh, in the margins. And the other aspect of prints, uh, particularly uh, etchings and engravings, uh, are that it's purely black and white. And line is such a commitment. You make a line, that's it. And particularly if you're etching, you can't go back and fix it. That's what you're trying to create. You can't layer another layer of beautiful red lacquer over the top of pink because it's only black and white. And one more aspect of that, smallness, miniatureness, uh, black and white, clarity, commitment. Another aspect is if you're nearsighted like me, um, it's really natural to want to pick up a print and look at it really closely, whereas everybody else, especially as we get older, their arms aren't long enough or they need a magnifying glass, and I don't need that. And I think that it is true that people who are particularly attracted to miniatures are likely to benefit, actually, from myopia because you can see minutia. You've blown my mind because I am nearsighted and <laughs> I studied miniatures in graduate school. So an example of one of the many things you learn from physicians who are interested in art and understand science and all of, all of these things that help us to see, right? I mean, we think about these things as sensorial, but mostly emotional, but there's science to all of this. So 1981, you're at the Grand Palais, you're having these conversations, Jacqueline's wanting to rent a container to put all the furniture on. You walk yourself back from that. 82 is a year where, where you start collecting, where you make an acquisition. Um, tell me about that. We went to this antique show that was at the Place Bonaventure every year in late November, early December. And there, there were dozens, hundreds of booths and there were a few print folk, but there was one guy who had all kinds of flowers, had some audubons, had uh, hookers, fruits, Pomonas londonensis, some ere, E-H-R-E-T, uh, flowers and so on. I just found them very attractive. We bought some stuff from him that winter and then went up to see him in Hamilton this uh, dealer. My sister lived in Oakville, so we paid a visit there. 
acquired some Elizabeth Gould, so a few birds, a few plums and apples and stuff like that. Put them up on, got them all framed, put them up on the wall, and it was like uh, Peggy Lee. Is that all there is? It just wasn't enough. Around that time, I was a visiting professor in Minnesota. A guy I got to be quite close to, Richard Simmons, was a print collector, but he was an eclectic one. He was not, he, he accumulated prints that were of uh, absolutely top-notch nature, and they went from, from Rembrandt through toulouse lautrec So there's quite a eclectic group, including Edward Hopper. And he had first-class stuff. And so the obvious thing is, uh, I was sort of gaga. Where did, how did you get all this stuff? I mean, you're, you're in Minnesota, for God's sakes. And so he, he told me, he, he dealt with a guy in Los Angeles and a, a dealer in, in New York. I mean, these were, these were really different times, eh? Like now, you know, to acquire a hopper is, is a six-figure undertaking no matter what, right? I'm just, the kind of level of discovery that you're describing here is really, really exciting for someone like me who, who you know, it's just this reminder that these are multiples, but there is a, a limit to the inventory available. So what an exciting, exciting discovery. I know I spent probably two afternoons or two early evenings with Chardonnay and uh, talking about all that stuff. So when I came back, I got in touch with this fellow in New York, and uh, he said, well, get some catalogs. So I immediately subscribed to Sotheby's and Christie's, London and New York. Called him, I don't know, three, four weeks before the next auction. And that's when we got those two domiers, which were perfect, actually. One was a music teacher, and the other was teaching some kid to do Some something. clarinet or oboe. Yeah. So on, in terms of auction, how, what percentage of the collection that's on view in this exhibition would you say was acquired at auction? I would say it's 50%. Well, yeah. some of them are big series. You know, all the months of the year were, that's, true. that's 12 in each set. And oh, you know, I would say it was close to 50, 40 to 50% were bought through auction, but always using someone else to work the auction floor. In other words, what I would do is I would go through the catalogs at night uh, before I went to sleep. Every night I'd go through the catalog, put stickies, post-its and so on. After but, a 12 hour day, yeah. Yeah. no big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. well it was actually, you're right. That is perfect, it was no big deal. It was just so normal, I thought. <laughs> I'm not sure well, she thought it was right. that normal. Surrounded, the bed surrounded with, with catalogs. Then we'd both fall asleep, and then all night long you'd hear gafunk because <laughs> the catalogs were falling off the bed. But in the morning he knew what he wanted, and he knew who to call, to, and he knew what his cap was for a given item, and sometimes let it go. Uh, but often it was about the quality. That was the most heartbreaking, I think, when he'd say he really wants something, and the price is right, everything is exactly right. But the person he sent to look at it calls up and says, I'm sorry, the condition is not museum quality. You don't want it. Let it go by. And that was often quite heartbreaking, actually. You know, could you articulate a little bit of what, what the strategy has been, if it was always in place or if it has kind of emerged as, as things went on? In the early 90s, when we came back from our second sabbatical, got settled into our new jobs and new lives, I brought everything out and looked at everything that we had and, and realized that uh, a couple of very basic things. One, we could never afford to have a survey collection of printmaking. Uh, I just didn't think that that was a feasible act for us to do either from the time point of view or from a financial point of view. And I think I didn't want to do it anyway. So we looked at what we had and, and we had a, quite a number of Gagnons, Clarence Gagnon at that time, and, and a lot of Dutch material and then I looked at our library and, <laughs> and found that we had lots of books on 
Dutch 17th century printmaking, which told me something that I liked that stuff. So we, we basically made a decision to go to the Dutch 17th century, and as it happens, late 16th, rather than in the Barbizon late French era, which would have included Millet and Daubigny and Jacques and maybe some of the Impressionists. So we abandoned the material in, that we had, which was modest, from France in the late 19th century, and, and picked two branches of direction. One was to collect all of Gagnon's prints, and the other was to create a collection of Dutch 17th century landscape and genre scenes. Well, I feel like we're back in the, you know, love of landscape, but pull to the city, right, and to genre. And this kind of, I always think of how the North embraces both and how, you know, it just reminds me of kind of the, the breadth of your own interests, right, in day-to-day -day life. And, but one thing that's a little bit of an outlier in the collection for me when I was going through it um, for the last few years was some of the Catholic prints. And, you know, Jacqueline, there's one in particular that's your favorite the dispute of the church fathers over the Holy Sacrament. And I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about how that, how that figures in. When we visited with another um, uh, gallery owner and, and dealer in New York about something rather specific that she had set aside for us to look at and which we did purchase, at the end of the table was this huge print and I didn't even know what it was. And it was clearly religious with a big figure of Jesus in the middle and sort of a cogitating God over the top. And Jesus looks very, very human. He looks a bit fat compared to every other portrayal that you ever see. So it was quite a curious kind of an image and it clear black and white. And then below that, there's Mary on one side and St. John on the other. But then you see St. John is not even looking at Jesus. He's supposed to be pointing to Jesus, but in this print, he's looking away at the lamb. And then you think, well, where are we in the story? You know, doesn't he know who Jesus is? or who Jesus is going to be. And, um, and only Mary's looking, she knows, She's, and she looks like herself. And then down below we see all these people arguing. The Old Testament figures seem to be all mixed up with the New Testament figures, but they're arguing about the nature of the sacrament. I realize that for most people listening to this, they're not interested in that. And they're going, oh my God, you know, get me out of here. Too much religion. <laughs> but actually, I was doing a theology degree during the time this was happening. So this imagery was sort of engaging me. And Jonathan bought it for me as a present, just as a present, no expectation. It would fit the collection, but it's by court, and he is Northern Netherlandish, uh, um, exquisite engraver, and I couldn't understand why he made this image. I thought it was rather daring. It occurred after the Trent Conference, which reestablished uh, sound Catholicism throughout Europe. So here he is under the nose of the Pope questioning the nature of the sacrament. Now that seems rather dangerous to me and I've never been able to find out if court remained Catholic once the Reformation took place or not. Well it's this idea just for everybody listening that you know whether or not you know the body of Christ is actually in the in in the host right this idea that whether it manifests in the sacrament and that was a a huge hotbed of not just debate, but religious warfare. I mean, especially in the North. So uh, I, I, when you talked about it in person, when we saw each other in Montreal, I just thought, I mean, this is a seemingly kind of boring through 21st century eyes, religious scene, you know, where in fact, it's, it's the site of kind of a political debate, you know, and religious conflict. I'm curious, two things, starting first with the ex exhibition. What do you hope people take away from it? You know, they're going to be visiting it this summer. We're going to be allowed to be in these spaces um, with much of the country vaccinated and enjoying art again after a long period of, of pause. So what do you hope that's, that experience is like for people who come to see, to see the exhibition of your collection? People would come away with an idea of what a collection is rather than what an accumulation of works on paper are. 
uh, and that you're you're trying to formulate an entity uh, which in a way tells a story so that if you look at most of those prints you will come away with a picture of Holland in the 17th century. You'll learn that they skated from December through the end of February. When they harvested wheat, it didn't look all that different from the way we harvest wheat now, except they used hand sides and things like that. That people hunted and fished, that there was a huge range of wealth. And you can just look at the clothing of the individuals. Um, if you look at the Sir Wooders series of 10 hunting scenes, you get an absolute panorama of a Dutch class, Dutch wealth, and who was doing the dog's body work. And all the layers of uh, society can be seen quite easily in uh, those settings. Bruegel's St. George's Fair, you'll learn an immense amount about Holland in the 17th century. So I think that there's a, a lot that a astute observer can take away that isn't going to cost them a nickel in terms of energy. They just have to be able to see what they're looking at. You've written this extraordinarily touching essay about this history of collecting. And in working together, you were so, I mean, you really inspired me when you said, look, I'd like for this collection to be shared with all Canadians. And you've made the decision to, to give the Northern Prince to the National Gallery of Canada. And that's a really, I mean, considering how personal this journey has been, decades long. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why you made that decision and what it means to you. The passage of time demands that you think about what are you going to do with all your stuff. Really, until with your visits here, the idea of our having an exhibition at the National Gallery surfaced. And and so you were going to come and see us in 2019 with Kitty and Sonia. And we used that as a node. I, I think of decision making in terms of nodes. So we used that as a node and uh, rewrote our wills the week before you came. And in the will it said that all of our Dutch stuff goes to the National Gallery. And we're so happy that we're going to be able to share it with the National Gallery and with Canadians, national, the National Gallery of Canada. You know, we've covered the exhibition. I guess what's on everybody's minds is what's next for you in your collecting life. We got a catalog this morning from Rumblers. In, uh, <laughs> Once a collector, always a collector. In terms of my own projects in collecting, it really is going to be at the hospital where we're trying to create a, a humanizing environment using art and using uh, the walls of this enormous building. The, the walls are endless and they need stuff on the walls and, and finding good material to put on the walls I think is one of the things that I will be focusing on over the next uh, several years. I, although, having said that, I'm not sure I can stop buying prints completely. Thank you so much, both of you, for being so open and giving us such an intimate view of everything that you're doing, and, and more from me very soon. <laughs>